OK. I'm going to manage, I promise. OK. Um, can you tell me when I'm 10 minutes from? Ah, OK. OK, perfect. OK, um, so. Um, I'm going to talk about Syskit. I'm first going to present very briefly what Syskit is about, and then I'm going to talk about what, where it's headed, which is actually the most interesting bit. Um, for those that asked what's the big difference between ROC and ROS, um, actually one of them is that ROC is a model, has a model-based tool chain. Um, so you have this co-generator called Origin, and that's the only way to build a component in ROC. Um, and this is the end of the thing, which is that's one, that Syskit is one of the main tools that actually are using this model. So in between, you don't use it so much. Um, you do, but not so much. Okay, um, Syskit today um, uh, allows you, it's a tool designed to make it simpler to build um, big, big, build, manage, and run Bigish component networks, so something like 40, 50 components, even actually, I would say, as high as 20. Like, at, as low as 20, you start really having this trouble when you do something imperative, like a ROS launch file or Ruby scripts in Rock. Um, this is getting a bit difficult. And if you want to dynamically reconfigure this 20, 30, 40, 50 component network, then doing it by hand is just hell. Um, if you don't have planners and stuff like that, but then it becomes a different kind of hell if you start having planners. Um, so that, that's what Syskit's for, okay? Um, so I'm gonna talk about what Syskit today does. Um, on the system design, you basically use Syskit, it's um, a, a DSL, embedded DSL in Ruby that allows you to define self-contained system network. So you basically say, okay, this guy here, don't, don't, doesn't matter so much. It's actually real examples, but don't try to read them. Um, is a joystick KUV control. Here I have my pipeline detector, which is a two component network. Um, then at this pose estimation, that's five component network. And they're all self contained, so you can run them at they are. Um, and they're manageable by humans. So it's like four, five, six, seven components. You don't have these like complex comp uh, connections. Usually you maybe have one loop, not much more. And then you, that, that's what the user does. It's what the user builds. And then he actually tells his kid, okay, now I want to combine them and tells him how to, like, which, which of these networks he wants to combine. And this kid is the one doing the combination. So first of all, you actually verify properties on, on the generated network. And at runtime, you can switch between them. Well, I'm gonna talk about runtime. Um, so there's a second layer. That's why you, you say you can switch between them. You can actually specify through a state machine representation how these different networks need to be coordinated. So you're gonna say, I'm start with this pip pipeline detector and joystick control, and whenever a pipeline's found, then I want you to switch to pipeline following autonomous behavior. And then when the pipeline's lost, I want to come back to uh, joystick control. Thank you very much. Um, so that's obviously super simple. You can do something much more complex. The bit being that these behaviors are all defined as component networks, a combination of component networks, and the switching the combination of them and the switching between them, you just say, I want to switch, and Syskit is the one doing the switching and deciding how to do switching. So you don't really have to think about how do I manage my big, my big networks anymore. Um, you manage smaller ones, you combine them and switch between them, and Syskit is doing the switching. It's a model-based system, and that's where like, you need origin at the beginning. Um, all the design is done offline. So you, you can actually design a complete robotic system without writing a single line of C++ code. You just write your component models, you start using Syskit to design your networks, um, and when you're happy, you start, for instance, writing the components. That's not how we do things, but it's definitely something possible. Something I did a few times, just to have an idea of how things would fit together. Um, but usually you do like 
this more incremental thing. You start developing and then you do the modeling and then you find out that would be a better way to split your components so you actually can prototype it in Syskit and then implement it differently and then so on and so forth. You find your workflow in the end. Um, so, well, okay, system design, the goal is having an offline iterative system design. That, and the offline is really that you can really work. You don't even have a robot. Um, so somebody else is fixing the vision. You can still do your, your model, like your coordination. At the, on the runtime side, um, <coughs> Syskit takes care of switching between the nets, and he does it in a smartish way. That is that if you have some part of your network that are identical between the two behaviors you want, it's not going to touch them, obviously. It would be completely dumb to like, shut down everything you have and then bring up everything else, while actually the only thing you want to change is one component in the two nets. But it's just keep doing it. You don't need to think about it. Um, and then it does a lot of monitoring and fault recovery. All right, it does a lot of monitoring, and it has tools to do fault recovery. And it can do composition of the temporal structures, so you can actually have multiple state machines in parallel, for instance, um, this kind of stuff. Okay, um, and, but the goal here is really like, I mean, on the runtime side, I come from labs that do a lot of planning and scheduling. Um, the runtime in the end is, is currently pretty simple. The, the management of the network is really the, the core functionality, but typically there's no advanced scheduling in there. It's pretty limited. Um, but the goal is really that to see it as a platform. It's really like a very good starting point. It's great for prototyping. If you need advanced scheduling, you would need to integrate a new scheduler in the, in the thing. But it's really a platform for execution monitoring and system adaptation. So it's all dynamic. Um, you can, like every part you can take out or bring a new one. Um, typically, I'd love somebody to put a proper scheduler in there. Um, <coughs> and right now, so that, that, that's the state today. Um, and I, I wouldn't claim that Syskit is easy to use um, by a, no stretch of the imagination. It does solve a complex problem. So if you have complex robotic systems, um, the barrier to entry to start using Syskit can be, might be lower than, like, you can have the net benefit still. But it's not like you, you still, I mean, the whole development workflow is, is not that streamlined. Huh? Um, and, and the goal right now for me is to get, to get past that and actually provide a development workflow that's really, really, like when people see it, it would be like, okay, that's, that's something I can, I think I could start to use. Um, and so it's really to get from Syskid, the um, modeling and runtime tool, to a more full-fledged development environment. Um, and that currently entails integration of testing, uh, having a graphical interface for to design the models because writing networks by hand is somewhat fun, but not so much. Um, integrating graphical interfaces into all Syskit concept and continuous integration. Um, so I'm gonna go through those. Um, um, okay, model checking. Um, there's gonna be a very nice um, forum tomorrow morning about robot control operating systems. Um, so I think that's a few I know are gonna talk about that. Problem of model checking is really expensive. Most of, of really true, interesting model checking is really expensive. So if it's directly in the workflow, so every time you do a change, you have to run your model checker, either you have a build farm to do the model checking for you, or you're not gonna use model checking anymore because each time you make a modification, you need a half an hour to start using your robot again. So um, here, that's why I put it into the test as in unit testing. It's a step that you would basically iterate over your code, iterate over your models. And at the same time, this is like the whole Syskit ID would, would run the model checking on the side and tell you there's a problem with your new models. Um, <coughs> there is unit testing integration code. Um, so here, it, it, I'm getting a bit into the specifics of how the whole thing works, but you can do a lot of stuff directly in Syskit. You can do like small, small loops, um, small behaviors. You can write them directly in there. It's Ruby, so it's great to like unit test it, please. Um, and you can unit test components without, without log files. Um, so here it's really having an environment where you can do all these kind of tests and it's, it's really, it becomes a test suite for your robot. It's really the thing. You really have a complete test suite for your robot. 
Um, okay, Syskit Designer. Um, well, that's, that's more of a, um, there's been prototypes for that. Um, it's really having a graphical interface to, to build your networks. Um, to first like build the, the smallish networks and then look at how the uh, combination of them looks like, what are the problems, see to rate over that and stuff like that. And the thing is, um, I, I, I've said that here because um, like there's one, two, three, four, five guys here and over the five there's already three of them existing. One existed, so there's code but it needs to be like brought up and the component config editor is the one where it doesn't exist at all. But it's really a combination of a lot of code that already exists. So I'm, I'm actually, it's pretty high on my priority list. Um, not because I personally, I personally don't mind so much writing the models by hand. It's, as I said, it's smallish networks. I don't need like, you don't need to build by hand big networks. That's what this kid does. Um, but still, I think it's something that would really integrate well into the whole Syskid workflow. Um, live system interfaces. Um, okay, when you, when you build graphical interfaces in Rock, and, and maybe you actually have less trouble in Rock, I don't know about that. Um, you really have this problem that the, the graphical interface becomes dependent on the names of your tasks, for instance, how you deploy your tasks, the name of the tasks, the name of the parts on the tasks. Moreover, you cannot say, I have a generic interface for this type of navigation. You can't really say that because somebody's gonna use one type of component, there's gonna be variations on what, how this thing is deployed and so on and so forth. And the modeling is there. Syskit is really there to put semantic on the networks. So you really have these structures that says, this network is my navigation and that component or that set of components in the network is doing this part of the navigation and that is doing that part and so on and so forth. So in principle, you can really start saying, I have this big graphical interface for rover navigation using decent kind of methods and this is how it's bound to this net template of networks in Syskit and then like what the live system interface would do is just bind one and the other. The other one is, is the opposite, is how do I interact with the Syskit system? So as I said, you can combine behaviors but you can do it in the models, you can also have a user doing it. Um, obviously, you get into trouble, into the trouble that he might want to start a new behavior that's not compatible with what runs and this kind of thing. So here the challenge is how do you let the user interact with the Syskit system? Let the user say, I want to start this new behavior or that set of new behaviors or I want to, to do this sequence but give him meaningful feedback on is that possible and if it's not possible, why and what do you want to do? So here actually is an example from the Maroon guys. Uh, it's something we wrote from the Maroon guys where if you have an AUV, um, well, an ROV actually in this case, you would have a, um, a subset of semi-autonomous behaviors like auto-heading, uh, auto-depth, they call it like that, um, or like following a line, this kind of things. And, and um, our view operator is expected to be able to say, I want to start this now and I want to stop it and I want to start that now and stuff like that. Which works great with Syskit except of, for this feedback, which is uh, what if he's tracking an object with the camera and then all of a sudden he says, now put auto heading on. Well, I cannot control heading in both ways. Or actually in this case you could by changing the controller. But um, so here you would really have a workflow where he says I want to have the heading and Syskit says okay you can't because there's already like object tracking on and object tracking on is doing heading control and what do you want to do? Do you want to turn off object tracking? Do you want to, t uh, t or do you want to abandon starting the heading? And so on and so forth. Um, okay and the last one actually is one of, uh, it's one of the grand plans. Uh, it's continuous integration, but for robots. And what do we do with robots? How do we test our algorithms? We generally feed a lot of data to them from a lot of logs, from a lot of experiments. And we want to benchmark the results. Um, well, first of all, you want to have a result, which is the first step. And then you want to benchmark the results to check that there isn't any regression. Um, next one is, of course, running simulation as well, and this kind of things. And Again, this kit here is, is interesting because you can define classes of, of behaviors. You can say, okay, I have this type of behavior that's with this pattern 
and then tell, like set up a continuous integration system is for this type of behavior, take all these data sets, run them. The result is these data streams on, on the output of my components and benchmark the output with that kind of thing. And then you put all of that on the server. You can do very smart, well, very smart. You can do smart stuff to avoid um, rerunning the same networks over and over again. So reduce as much as you can uh, computing the same thing over and over again. And, and verify that you don't have regressions. And it's really like, for me, that's something I would really love to have. Each commit, you run, like you run a year of data sets on them and see if there's any trouble. That would be really, really great. Um, okay, some, some state. Um, so the testing is done. And there's testing integration. Um, it's really like, it really looks like you need testing. You basically say syskit test and it's running your tests. Um, there's um, syskit designer. What's missing is actually running the tests um, behind the scenes. So that every time you change a model that the thing would run the test and tell you that you have a problem in this and that model. Um, and the composer. So the thing that would actually allow you to, to build networks. Um, the um, live UI. Is, uh, is something that we start working on for a project I have, and then the continuous integration, I would say it's long term. Um, we have, we need to develop and integrate some parts of it for projects we have, but it's not a big requirement. So as usual, if it's not a big requirement, it might not happen soon. Uh, yo. I think that's all, yeah, this is all. Everything happens. <coughs> Questions? Do you have a I'd say anything complex, but it's a bit of a, there's two, two answers to that. Um, you can do without a skit and you might be not unhappy. Um, it's a matter of who's doing it and who's making the decisions. I've saw that a few times, that unfortunately professors don't develop robots. So I've seen guys take six months integrating a functionality that should have taken them a week, but the professor weren't happy about it. And actually, and the guys were just like pulling their hair out. They couldn't, they couldn't stand it anymore. That's one thing with the iterative process. This kit also makes it easier to add more functionality incrementally. Instead of having to spend a year specking your complete networks and all the shapes of all your networks and then implementing it um, because you have this whole process. Um, um, then on the, on the dynamic parts, um, it, it's the same thing. It's not something you can't do without. You, you can do all you can do with this kit, you can do without this kit in my opinion, is just more transparent and probably safer. Well, safer as in it's harder to break something. As soon as you reach a certain complexity, and, and that's, I think, is uh, the key word. And it's a key word for Rock as well. That's the answer from his question earlier. Um, and there are a certain level of complexity. All networks are the same. All frameworks are the same, sorry. Um, the thing is, if you never cross the border where it's that become different, um, then you'll be fine. If you pick one, you do all your development being super framework specific, and you cross that line, then you're in trouble. So that's why we say this thing, separate libraries from, from framework code, because if you cross that line, you want to have the choice. Um, before that, I would even say just use ROS, but it might not be the right uh, form for that. Uh, but uh, it's really the crossing of the line that is that where, like, there's a line where this kid becomes really, like, where I would say non, non, not using this kid is making you, like, is getting complex. The complexity gets exponentially harder, like, developing becomes exponentially harder, and this kid keeps, keeps it linear, for instance. Um, 
But below that line, syskit adds complexity. I'm not, um, of course. Uh, if it would be that easy, then... Uh. No, but like, for example, uh, well, all, all robots with the minimum of autonomous behavior with sensor integration, uh, um, would, I would, would that be a first line, or what would it... Like, one, one, one line is, do you want to be able to reconfigure your system? Or is your system, can your system work with one network that is just working, okay? That's one, one big thing. If it's one network, then syskit helps still because you still have like this whole, like the whole offline design and you can check stuff and everything. But it's, it's become like you have to design only one network. So if you spend one day more to design a network, um, yeah, since you have to design it once, it's not so much of a big deal. Um, the next one is obviously the size of nets. Um, if you start having like 40, components, this usually becomes a bit difficult to look at and really understand. Um, below 10, yeah, you can do it manually, that's for sure. In between, I guess it's gray. Um, I don't really have a line, honestly. I, I don't have like a bullet point thing if you meet all these criteria and sys kits for you. Um, I know that's kids for me, but I, I can understand as well that it's, it's, it becomes a bit of a different concept. Um, and I mean, it's far from perfect code-wise, so there's a bit of a cost there as well, for sure. <coughs> but as you say, it's kind of leveraging the whole underlying model um, approach of Orocos in the sense of, or like of, of uh, origin of yeah. Rocks. Yeah, we, we haven't really reached that yet. So no, there isn't a library, but it, it is partly true that I didn't talk about it. It's part of how, of, of some of the concepts in, in the syskit that um, you can define abstract networks. That is part of the of syskit, of course. But then it really gives you that. It uh, tells you these two components are meant to be used in that context. So you need a post estimator, feed it to that port, and then you need just an orientation that you feed into that port. and then and so on and so forth. So it's really telling you not only if they have a component, but how do you use it? And it keeps it up to date, which is really the problem with documentation, that usually documentation is what rots the quickest, um, especially with components, and especially with like highly iterative development processes. Um, that's what the model-based approach gives you, that's true. It's not, yeah, it will, it will reduce the barrier to entry, which is really the, the, the thing with syskit right now, is uh, you have a barrier to entry, and so you need to be in the use case where the gain is higher than the barrier. Um, but if you have a nice editor? Then the barrier gets lower, and then, of course, it's quicker to get into, well, that's useful. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, you, you have the, the model that Syskis uses itself yeah. to uh, represent, the, represent the networks, represent meta information, these kind of things. If you use a model checker, especially because it's offline, what I would say is what you're basically going to do is augment that with information the model checker needs because you need to extend the model, obviously. And then you basically translate between the structure it's using to whatever input file or structure your model checker needs. Run the model checker. I mean, Let's say that way, good model checkers 
Um, like typically BIP is actually a great example. Um, I don't know if you know BIP, but um, the, the definitely the added value of integrating it is not in how it's integrated, is it's the model checking code itself. That's where the complexity is. So if the only thing you have to do is do a bit of translation between the model each Cisco is using and the model BIP needs, that's not much. Um, you have a big gain and a small cost. So uh, my, the one reason why there's no BIP here is first I didn't have the time, and second BIP is not open source, which always bothered me. No, it's not. Oh. Uh, it's free for academic use, but I'm not an academic anymore. <laughs> so. <laughs> Okay. Hi, ah, microphone.